mics are hot. And then um, we'll go ahead and get started. Hello? Yeah. All right. So we're in this big, giant room. But this is a breakout session. So if you're willing and able to maybe come a bit more into the center, I think it'll be a little more intimate and um, enjoyable that way. So if you're willing and able to move to the center, we'll get started here in just a moment. Do you guys want to test them really quick? Testing. Hey, looks like they work. <laughs> nice. Welcome to karaoke. <laughs> All right, are we good to go? To get started? All right, so thank you all for coming to um, this session that I am kind of um, abruptly or impromptu <laughs> moderating. I'll explain in just a minute. And. Um, had I known that this was going to be happening in this way, I had some slides, but I can't get the computer to connect, and so here we are without them. Uh, so I'll introduce myself. I am Laura Sprinkle. I am the director of training at Leadership Smarts, and I manage our alignment training programs. And Patty Beach, who is the author of The Art of Alignment, A Practical Guide to Inclusive Leadership, was intended to moderate this panel today, but she tested positive for COVID this morning. <laughs> so, as well as one of our other panelists, Louis Lugo, if you looked at the app, you can see there's a different gentleman up here today. <laughs> this is Roger Tonus. I'll let him introduce himself in just a moment. So Patty is very disappointed that she couldn't be here today to talk about her work. Uh, but Patty has been my mentor for the past several years, and I'm really honored to be here in her place today to talk about the art of alignment and inclusive leadership. So the art of alignment is um, the book, the methodology, the process, is based on the core belief that every voice matters, and together we really can solve any problem. Uh, and it is that core belief that informs our mission as an organization, which is to help leaders build a better world in a better way. And most leaders want to be inclusive. You know, there is this intuition of knowing that if I'm, you know, collaborating, bringing voices in, that it's going to come to a better outcome. The problem is most leaders just don't know how. They don't know the practical how to. Of, of leadership, and that is what this book is all about. That is what the Art of Alignment, A Practical Guide to Inclusive Leadership, is really about. It's how to lead inclusively, but to do it practically, efficiently, and strategically. And the Art of Alignment is the roadmap to inclusive leadership, and it is based on our 345 alignment framework. So we have you know, a months long training pro program for this. So I'm gonna give you a very, very high level of what the art of alignment is. But it is based on three principles, four steps and five C's of alignment. So the three principles, which we'll get to with our panelists today are the principle of iterative co-creation, the idea that two heads are better than one, that we can make this process um, develop and improve over time by working collaboratively. Uh, the second principle is the SHUVA principle. So SHUVA is an acronym that stands for five universal needs. The need to feel seen, heard, understood, valued, and appreciated. And lastly is the versatility principle. And the versatility principle is based on the core belief that the best solutions are found when we're able to manage and balance opposite energies. And one of the opposite energies that we talk about in our work is the balance of masculine and feminine styles of leadership. I'll talk a little more about that too. And then the four or five part of it are the four steps in the five C's of alignment, which is the actual roadmap and the formula to propose an idea, probe, using a very specific method for gathering feedback, 
to then go offline, iterative, right, and come back with a reproposal and work through iteratively until you get to a really strong co-created solution. Um, and the five C's for feedback, which we'll get to here just as a quick um, overview, are asking first for clarifications, then compliments, concerns, changes, and finally testing commitment. So with that, I am going to allow our panelists here to introduce themselves and uh, we'll get started. Thanks. Hi, I'm Roger Tonus, and I'm the managing partner of a firm called Founder Advisors. And I'm an engineer by background, and I've done a lot of startups in addition to working in large tech companies. And what I do is advise uh, startup founder teams on how to get aligned and move forward on all the different things that they have to do. Uh, so that's, that's me, and I'll pass this off to Michelle. Thanks, Roger. I'm Michelle Loy. Um, I am a pediatrician who works in the ICU at Children's and also was recently promoted to be quality director. So as quality director, I oversee systems processes that uh, make care for our little sick, sickest patients better in the ICU um, and was given Patty's book, and that's how I got connected to her. Thank you, Michelle. Hi, my name is Samantha Fuchs. You can call me Sam. And I currently work for Aerojet Rocketdyne on the program management team, um, though my background is a little bit more diverse than that. Um, we'll just say it's, it's a, life is a journey, and, and having a diverse group of people on your team is definitely the way to go. Awesome. Thank you so much, Sam. So to get us started, to hear from these amazing leaders today talking about how this work has impacted their leadership, I want to start with kind of a global question of how have the principles and practices of the art of alignment helped you to become a more inclusive leader? So I don't know who wants to take that first. Well, I'll start actually. So um, one, of the, so one of the things that Stephen Covey and even Patty hit on in their work is, is starting with your purpose first, your, your mission, why are we here? Um, sometimes understanding where we've been is a good idea of where you need to go in the future, but also having a process to follow in that. And so when I, when I read Patty's book, one of the things that really resonated with, with me was really to define the purpose of why we're here. And most recently I was in an employee engagement group um, and we were talking about all the different ways that we can improve employee engagement on the site. And there's a lot of low-hanging fruit available. Um, you know, it's, it, it would be hard for us to snap our fingers and all of a sudden make all of the resources available for people to, to do what they, like give them all the tools that they need. Um, but so we were looking for some of the low-hanging fruit. And one of the things that was identified was that we hadn't built a lot of intentional swag, you know, stuff to give away. And so, so they were like, we need tumblers. And I was like, nobody wants a tumbler with Aerojet Rocketdyne written on it. And, and I sat in that meeting and I was thinking and um, I was like, you know, um, the, the RS25 program, we're supporting the Artemis missions. It's a huge chunk of the work at the site there in Los Angeles. Um, and, and we have a purpose, right? The, the Artemis program is to go to the moon and then to go to Mars. And this is like really fits in with the space business unit mission statement to expand the boundaries of space and technology for the benefit of humanity. So I was like, what if, what if we built a tumbler um, and we designed it such that it gave people that purpose, you know, first stop moon, next stop Mars. And so um, that was was the idea and we we ended up um, going through the through Patty's process here and um, so that was my proposal um, we had some people ask questions about you know what shape should it be how big should it be you know what should it function like so there's some proposing um, we turned it over to graphics who um, took my idea and they they you know, added to it, made it better, um, and then we closed and funded and purchased the tumblers. And so um, that's what we see here um, that we were able to do. And it was just so exciting to, to have a product that we were bringing to our LA site. And the minute that we told the other sites at Aerojet Rocketdyne what we were doing, all of a sudden the sites in Redmond and um, West Palm Beach and uh, elsewhere in the company, like, oh, can we put an order in too? So um, it was really cool to, to sort of go through this process of you know propose probe repropose close and um, and have a product that really gave the employees something to align around. Awesome. Thank you, Sam. 
Sam, that's really awesome. Um, so I think that one of the uh, main principles from Patty's book that really impacted me is actually the Shuva principle, which we'll talk about, um, and ways that we can establish psychological safety. So in my line of work, um, it is a high-stress situation, functioning team members, parents, and patients that are in a very vulnerable situation. And so when you're at the bedside and that patient's heart stops, you rely on this teamwork, and you rely on each of your team members to be able to speak up when they notice an error there, because it impacts the patient's care. And so the Shuva principle allows me to know each, each team member, and in a code situation where it's very high stress, for me to look at that person and say, yes, you can speak up when there's an error, so that we can work together to provide the best care for this child. From a systems perspective, I also rely on those team members, these multidisciplinary team members, whether you're a physician, whether you are environmental services that helps um, mops the floors and cleans the rooms after the patients are there. I rely on their input and that they're seen and that their input is valuable for us to come up with these system improvements that overall improve the care of multiple patients. So um, psychological safety is very important and this is a framework to do it so that you make sure you do it the same way every time. Yeah, thank you, Michelle. We, we call it love through the logic door. <laughs> that it gives this, you know, very kind of backdoor roadmap. Um, yeah, Roger. Yeah, and building off that love through the logic door. Um, you know, logic as an electrical engineer with multiple engineering degrees and having worked in tech my, my whole career, um, we tend to, as engineers and technologists, to be, you know, not have a lot of, uh, you know, we have a lot of logic, but we don't have enough of the love. And so I think what I've learned in leading my teams and also teaching uh, startup founders that are, in many cases, very tech-focused is, you know, it's not just about the technology. It's about the people who are building the technology. Make them feel safe. Make them feel safe uh, and seen, heard, understood, valued, and appreciated to talk about Shuva again. And I think this is an area in the world of tech that, that's underappreciated, how important it is to getting the outcomes instead of just focusing, focusing on the ones and zeros. And when I teach this, the, the great thing about it with technology people is, again, love through the logic door. It's a, it's a formula. We as engineers, we love processes, we love formulas, we, we love code. It's almost like the secret code to having people skills. That's what I tell my technical people. And they immediately light up, what, there's code? <laughs> I can follow, I can execute code. And so that's why it's made a huge difference for me personally as a leader in tech, but also for the leaders that I coach. Yeah, thank you, Roger. I'm glad that we jumped right into the Shuva principle because I think, you know, Michelle, you brought up psychological safety. And when we're talking about minorities or marginalized populations and we're trying to bring diversity into organizations because we know it's going to be better, but, you know, we're talking about groups of people who have not had a safe voice at the table. So this is inviting a, a strategy for how to cultivate that psychological safety that's going to empower people to bring their voices forward, to feel that it's okay to speak up, that I can make a proposal, you know, and we can dialogue around this and really coming from that model of leadership that co-creation leads to co-ownership, that you will always come up with a better outcome when you are working collaboratively. But, you know, people can sometimes get um, like, oh, I don't have time for that right? You know, I'm already so busy. How can I go invite more voices into the room? So I, I'm curious if you guys might have something to speak on there of, of how this process helps to make inclusive leadership more efficient and, and more strategic. Uh, I, I'll talk again. I'm following up on my last comments, um, you know, efficiency. What's great about this approach, again, as I said, it's like executing code is you can bring more voices into the room but get to a, a conclusion faster. And I find that to be really powerful in that it's like, wow, I don't have to worry about bringing, quote, too many voices in the room. And, and there's a, a logic and there's a cadence to how you go through this process. And by the end, you know, not everybody's going to be happy with it. But what, as, as Laura said, co-creation creates co-ownership. You're going to, you get to the end and you think, hey, it isn't the perfect thing that I would like to have, but I feel like at least my fingerprints are on this, right? I, so I own it. I think uh, another statement is people don't tend to tear down what they build is another statement. And so um, 
for, uh, for the quality Im uh, improvement processes in the ICU. Sometimes it takes a lot of effort to get these projects ongoing. Um, and a lot of times, if you don't get everybody's voices in the beginning, you have poor buy-in. And so the project might get started, but then people feel like they're getting demands from up above and they're not as engaged in the process. So in terms of making things more efficient, certainly you have to gather all the voices in the beginning and that takes time, but it is surely going to ensure that your, your process will be much more smooth and that there's gonna be more collaboration as it goes on. So um, I'm, I'm a big fan of efficiency and um, there's something I learned when I had kids and that is that kids thrive on rhythm. They thrive on routine. They, they want to know what's next. And that is the same thing for adults, too, and, and people that you work with. And one of the things that I, I really loved about um, some of the, one of the tools, the, the five Cs, we haven't gotten to the five Cs yet, but I'm going to step on it for a moment. Please. please. <laughs> um, is that when, when you make this proposal process, um, I remember I was in college and I was giving an oral presentation, and at, at, Five minutes in, the professor stopped me and just tore me a new one. And I felt about this big, right? Like, he did not follow the process that I was expecting <laughs> in terms of feedback. Um, I didn't even get to the point that he was, he was getting to because I didn't have enough time to do it. So when, you're, when you make a proposal and you get to this probe section, um, the first thing is offer the opportunity for people to ask questions and get clarifications. Maybe they didn't understand something. Maybe they were multitasking and missed part of what it was that you had to say. So these clarifications help really guide the conversation. And then the next thing, uh, and this goes to creating shuva, is really find some goodness in what it is that's proposed. Give some compliments show and demonstrate to the person with that proposal that you saw them, you heard what they had to say, you understand what they said, and that, you, you know, that, that there's value there, and, and that will help them feel appreciated. And, and that's all the good stuff, right? Um, then you get to the concerns. And these are not concerns because the person's wrong or the proposal's bad. Um, it's, it's these are the gaps, you know, had you considered this, I'm concerned about that, you know, and it's, and it's not tearing it down, but really it's finding the opportunity to um, make changes. And that, of course, is our fourth C, is um, how can we tweak or adjust this proposal so that it addresses the concerns, it keeps all the goodness that was in it. Um, and, and once you have that, once you've, once you've um, got the clarifications, you've complimented the heck out of it, you've addressed the concerns, made those adjustments and changes, um, now you have everybody's fingerprints all over this proposal, right? Um, and that's when you get commitment, right? That's when everybody gets on the bus and y'all go there together. Um, and and once, you, once you get that commitment, that's part of that reproposal process and close. And what's, what's sort of fascinating about this is that um, if you, if you take these tools into a meeting and you follow this step, these steps every single time consistently, people know what to expect, right? They know what's coming next. They know that their bucket's going to get filled up and then, <laughs> then something's going to get pulled away, but that's okay because at the end of the day, you're going to get to a product that's better. And, um, and that's what makes it more efficient, I think. And that's what builds that psychological safety to know that this is the process. It's intentional in its flow and it's intentional in what comes first and next and so on and so forth. Yeah, again, to talk to what you were talking about in, in terms of kids, I think that's what it gives kids, that, that flow. They feel safe, yeah. you know, and at heart, we're all kids still, I think, and especially when we're in a creative space. And so what I love about the five C's that, that Sam just talked about is, um, you know, it, it, as I, going back to what I was, said earlier, it doesn't take longer when there are more voices in the room. It actually goes faster, not just when you're in the room, but afterwards, right? Because we've all been situations where we've been in a meeting and there's, you know, five, eight, ten people there, but not all the stakeholders are in the room, okay? But if I've seen this with, with my teams. Uh, we go through the art of alignment process and after we've used this a lot uh, in the past, it's not only just the people that are being trusted, it's the process itself. So we could go out and say, hey, I, w I was out that day, I didn't get to be part of that alignment. And it's like, oh, but you used the art of alignment and 
you know, tell me how it went, what were the concerns were, and then you're just like, well, if you use the process, it's probably fine by me. Uh, and so it, that's what I call the, the alignment culture. Uh, when, over time, when people start to get comfortable with it, and they're saying, okay, I trust the team. But in reality, it's a combination of trusting the team using the process, not just trusting the team. And that's what I love about it, is it, it builds a momentum of being able to not just get aligned on anything, but to stay aligned and follow through. Because that's the piece that, that everybody talks about. Oh, well, we talked about this in a room and we agreed and now nobody's following through on it. That's the other piece that I really like about this approach is you get that follow through. People feel committed, uh, the fifth C, the commitment test. And not, not only, in, in addition to all those things, you provide equity in the process because you apply the same um, principles to every single project that you hear, every single idea. And so you make sure that regardless of implicit biases, and, which we all have, you apply the same process. Yeah, thank you guys, that was awesome, really awesome conversation about the five C's. Um, I think, Sam, you should come teach that for us. That was really good. <laughs> Um, so, I think it was you, Sam, when you were talking about the um, coming to an ultimately stronger product or solution, you know, and so I want to I wanna shift into that iterative co-creation conversation. And first of all, what is that? You know, again, it's that idea that two heads are better than one, that we don't have to have all the answers, we don't have to know all the steps, we just need to know the first step. We need to have an idea and to be able to propose that idea and then co-create around it and go through multiple rounds of that, you know, and ultimately getting to something that is much stronger than any individual contributor could create. So I would love to hear a little bit from, from you guys about, um, just about that principle and how it helps you to lead inclusively and how it's informed what you're doing in your, in your role. Okay, so back when I first started at Aerojet Rocketdyne, about two or three years in, I was invited to the table to be part of the Space Business Unit Culture Committee. Um, I happened to be in the right place at the right time and knew a lot of people because of the work that I had been assigned. So I had a really fantastic network of people um, there at the company. And in this first meeting, it was um, on the eve of the 50th anniversary of the Apollo mission, which our company was part of by making those F1 engines, among other things. And, um, and the history of our company is, is so deep and so vast, and sometimes we get stuck there. Um, but what's also really cool about it is that we are a company that has gone through several mergers and acquisitions, and we are made from a whole bunch of other companies. And so... Um, at the end of the meeting, um, there was a sort of last round, anybody have any questions, thoughts, observations? And I kind of raised my hand and I was like, did you know we don't have a mission statement? <laughs> like, well, we have goals and objectives, yeah. <laughs> but why are we here, <laughs> right? Um, and he's like, and um, the gentleman who was there is, that's really hard. And I was like, yeah, I know, that, that is really hard. Um, and and I, I knew, I knew, um, based on some research that I had done in school, that um, creating a mission statement's not only the hardest thing that your organization can do, but it's one of the most critical things that you can do. That mission statement, you can use to apply it to every business case. Um, you can use it to attract, engage, and retain your employees. And so um, this leader said to me, well, I can't make a mission statement for the company because that's not within my umbrella, but I can make a mission statement for my business unit and I need your help. And so he charged the committee with doing a little research. And so this becomes like the ultimate group project, right? <laughs> and, and we started um, asking our network you know, questions. What gets you excited about coming to work today? What's your favorite part? Why are you here? You know, um, and, and getting that feedback. Uh, we, we brought that back a couple months later and um, presented our findings and even some straw men sort of mission statements. And He's like, this is great, but I need my leaders, my executive leadership team, to be aligned to this mission statement, and they need to own it too. So why don't you come back at our senior executive retreat, and you can do a, same, a similar exercise with them, and by the end of this retreat, we will have something. Great. So that's when like, the family feud game began, right? So um, we, we took the senior leaders through the exact same questions that we had asked of our colleagues and our friends in the, on campus, 
And um, they answered with what got them excited about coming to work every day, right? And um, at the end, we, we'd write everything down, and then we'd flip the, you know, survey says, these, these are why the people that work for you come to work every day, right? They, they come here because, it, you know, this is bigger than themselves. This, um, we're, we're going really cool places like the moon and Mars. Um, and so at the end of the day, um, after going through this whole process of helping the, provide context for why are the people that work here here, and why are the leaders here, and where are we going as a business? Um, the leaders um, were able to um, coalesce on a single mission statement for the Space Business Unit, which is expanding the boundaries of space and technology for the benefit of humanity. Now, I didn't like the word humanity, but I was so proud to have been part of um, identifying the problem and working with a vast network to get inputs on what got people excited about coming to work every day um, and, and to be invited to the table to the senior executive meeting um, to go through this process of developing this mission statement. That um, was so bucket filling for me that I am like 100%, 110% behind it, right? So um, if, if, you had, if you had just asked you know, somebody on the culture committee to come up with a statement or to... Um, you know, hand that over to marketing and let them do it, you would have gotten a completely different product. And it wouldn't have been authentic. It might not have been as fulfilling. Um, and so that's where that iterative co-creation um, really helped guide the business and give ourselves that purpose. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, well, the word, the first word in iterative co-creation I think is important. And I'm a control systems engineer, so I like, you know, kind of going around the feedback loop and knowing that it's a, it, it's a continuous process. And so instead of writing things in stone, what iterative co-creation for me means is this is going to be an ongoing story, right? We're going to, I'm going to be part of that story. And it's not just going to be a one and done and we write it in stone and then we move on. It's going to be, hey, we're going to be constantly thinking about new ways to do this. And to me, that, that's exciting. Uh, that, you know, there's not just going to be one time that I get to participate and then we're going to be, you know, a flat plateau of no change. Uh, change is the only constant in life. We all know that. And so that, that iterative co-creation, I think, it sets a, a culture of engagement with everyone who comes to understand that hey, you know, I come to work every day because I know there's an opportunity to contribute in a significant way every day. And that's what I like about iterative co-creation. And, and that when you're contributing, that it's actually being heard. Yeah. Right. <laughs> that, that it's not just paying lip service to inclusion, but it's really inviting as many voices as possible into the room. Not every one of those voices is going to have a vote, but your solution is going to be stronger when you, when you get that collective wisdom. Yeah, Michelle. Yeah, and Laura, it's, um, it's such a relief to know that you don't come with all the answers to the table and that what you end up creating as the answer will be far better than what you could have created by, by yourself. And so I, I think it allows for an openness, it allows for some vulnerability, that you don't know what things will look like exactly, but you guys are all driven by this similar mission um, to create something really, really cool. Yeah, it does. It takes some of the pressure off, right? <laughs> awesome. Thank you guys for those great comments. So I want to chat a little bit um, about the versatility principle. So we've talked some about iterative co-creation. We've talked about Shuva. I, I hope we'll get back to that. But I do want to chat a little bit about versatility, about this idea that the best solutions come out of not one pole or the other pole, but they come from the ability to kind of flex in and out of the strengths, um, you know, like task and relationship. Both of those things are important. They have different levels of importance at different times. And strong leaders and strong leadership has the ability to kind of flex in and out of those two polarities. Um, one we talk about a lot in the book is the masculine and feminine paradigm. Um, also, facts and feelings, there's rest and activity is a polarity. So talk a little bit about versatility and how that impacts your leadership and specifically helps you to lead more inclusively. Well, I'll say a few words about that. Um, you know, you talked about um, uh, some of the polarities there, and I just think that 
everything in the universe is based in some polarities, positive and negative charge. Sorry not to geek out too much as a scientist engineer, but um, what emerges out of these polarities is, is creativity. And if we get over-polarized, and we, we see it every day in the news, we've, we've gotten polarized in so many different ways. And if we just polarize, but we don't have a blend, an analog blend of, of everything in that spectrum, right? The diversity of the spectrum, not just the two poles. That's where the real creativity and the real power is. And so when I teach versatility and explain that to people, it's like, look, there's no right answer. There's just answers that are, are more or lesser uh, appropriate for the time that we're in and the situation that we're facing. And that's why diversity is so important. It's not just left or right. It's everything in between as well. And that's where you get the real magic as far as, as I can see. I, I see teams become more than the sum of the parts. Sometimes I like to say, uh, you know, I can, my team becomes a hot team, but it never burns out. Thank you, Roger. And I think the part of being an inclusive leader is practicing versatility and being able to represent voices that are not present at the table when you have the meeting, and being able to be flexible and, and represent both sides of that polarity. Um, for example, uh, if we have a complex patient, we uh, have these uh, complex uh, medical rounds where we have all the teams sitting together talking about what should we do next for this patient, um, answering some hard um, decisions. We have a wonderful social worker named Lisa Justice, who when we talk about the really heavy medical things, she always comes forward and she says, where is the family in all of this? How are they feeling? How can we support mom? And it's, um, I think that that, that breaks, that, that brings the polarity back to, to taking care of a patient and their family as a whole. And so incredibly important. Thank you. That was really beautiful, actually. I love that you have a social worker whose last name is Justice. I think that's quite poetic, actually. Um, I, I was just in another panel discussion. They were talking about intentionality and inclusivity and how you have to intentionally be inclusive because if you're not intentionally inclusive, you're, you're unintentionally exclusive. And um, that really stuck with me on this, um, and especially the versatility topics that you, that you brought up in terms of wanting to make sure you had everybody at the table, including those people that don't have the medical background but are thinking about mom who's like really worried, right? I took my kid to the ER one day. He needed to get stitches in his head. And one of the nurses looked over at my husband and they're like, dad, why don't you take a seat? <laughs> like, we got to take care of dad or else dad's going to become a patient too, right? So um, ha having people on the team that are, have the freedom and the flexibility to, to look not just at this, but look at the whole picture is, is so, so critical to be able to give them that headspace and that free time. Um, we, we can't expect our, our employees, our teammates to be machines just cranking out work time and time again. We've got to give them, you know, they're, they're going to work hard for you, right? But you also got to give them a venue to, to get to know one another and maybe play a little bit. And, and bringing that, that play into the workspace is, is so, so critical. Um, last year we had a, an ID and E week, and um, I remember sitting in a meeting, I was like, you know what would be really kind of fun? What happens if we just brought like a Lego kit into the break rooms? So we just dropped Legos into the break rooms and, and uh, challenged people to build something that um, aligned to the theme of what does belonging mean, right? And they're like, we've never thought about bringing Legos into, <laughs> into work. Like, and and um, so I had the pleasure of you know, walking around the different break rooms and seeing these creations come to life over the course of the week. And, and it was so fun to see the joy that, um, that the folks had um, when they approached the break room. It, it was able to give them a moment to you know, set aside and, and sort of re-energize re just a little bit. And, and you have to make those opportunities available for, for your team, so else you're, you're just gonna burn them out so fast. Yeah. yeah, I was just gonna say I love that because you know there's a spectrum between work and play. It's not just a polarity, right? And, and if you think of it as on a spectrum and you can be moving ac across it in a, in a dynamic way, then you get the benefits of both. And suddenly work can become play and people can put a lot of work uh, into play. <laughs> yeah. yeah, thank you. Um, I don't, I don't know if this is speaking of play, but <laughs> maybe speaking of work. 
what would you say to, to the students, to people entering the workforce, to emerging leaders about how to lead inclusively from the start, how to be really intentional and proactive about it using some of these principles, or, or maybe even speaking a little bit about your own experience in that lane, but to, to speak to that, um, that population here and that experience of emerging leadership, how could you take these principles and embed them um, from the start of your career? Michelle? So we, um, we train medical students and residents and, and fellows, and I think the, the first principle is you lead by example, right? If you give them shuva, you give them psychological safety, I think they pick up on those things too. And the nicest thing about Patty's model um, is that the, the, the fact that there's shuva, something you can remember, is an acronym that you can remember what each thing um, stands for. And, and the, the, is it the, it's five, it's five C's. Five C's yeah five C's, um, th those are just very practical things that you can carry in your back pocket. And I've taught some fellows this so that they can lead their own meetings, um, whether that may be just at the bedside or bigger meetings with other people. It's just good advice, just practical nuggets of wisdom. Yeah, I, I would say that, you know, what I love about uh, the book is she, is she has the concepts of what she calls memorable success formulas, which is kind of what Michelle's talking about. And, and also one of the things that, that is important in leadership that I've always really liked is this servant leadership or you're not there to sell and tell and, and tell people what they won't do, which I'm in effect micromanage. We all know that that's something that we don't want leaders to do to us and we shouldn't do to, to the people we lead. And also just to quote my favorite quote from the Tao Te Ching from Lao Tzu is, uh, when all is said and done, good leadership is at the end of all things, they'll think they've done it themselves. And that's when you know you're a good leader, is when you feel like you're not having to do anything. You're not micromanaging, you're not doing it for them. Instead, you're creating an environment in which their brilliance starts to shine and they start to, I, sometimes I call it going from me to we. And when I see my team become a we, it's almost like there's another entity in the room that wasn't there before, right? That's that hot team concept I talked about a little earlier. And, it, and it's thrilling and you think, well, I'm sitting here not doing that much. Good, <laughs> that's the way to lead. Um, so if I were um, to give myself a piece of advice um, or, or a student in the room or, or even somebody that aspires to be a leader, um, my piece of advice would be to ask questions. And don't ask the same question twice. Nobody likes being asked the same question twice, right? Um, it's, it's ask the clarification question if you didn't understand the answer. Um, but ask questions and, and seek out those people that are quiet. Those people that are quiet aren't quiet because, you know, they have nothing to offer. They're quiet because they're observing. They're seeing so much. And it's not just going, you know, and knocking on the door of the highest person in the office. You know, sometimes it's, you know, the person next to you or the person that you bump into at the water fountain, right? So ask those questions. Find out about them. And in, in asking those questions, that's where you start to find the superpowers that they have. And that's, once you, once you get to know them, you're, you're shuvaing them, then you're able to really harness that and, and give them that psychological safety. And you're able to then really excite your team and get, you know, keep them engaged in the process and, and moving forward. So my, my piece of advice would be to ask questions. Yeah, so great segue. Are there any questions? <laughs> we... <laughs> We have about 10 minutes left. Do you guys have any questions for our panelists about alignment and inclusive leadership? Yeah. What's the acronym for SHUVA? I, I think I might have missed it. Or... Yeah, so SHUVA um, is an acronym that stands for five universal needs that all humans have. It's the need to feel seen, heard, understood, valued, and appreciated. And so seeing that person for their gifts, their struggles, their talents, their strengths, you know, hearing them, are, are you actually listening? Are you listening to respond? Are you listening to understand, to hear what's under the words that they're saying? Are you valuing that person? I think the V is probably the most important out of Shuva because really valuing someone means that I can set aside my ego and my judgment 
long enough to, be, to have my opinion changed by you, to have myself be informed by you. That's really valuing someone. And then to appreciate them, to really say, thank you. <laughs> Send a thank you note, buy them dinner, you know, to do that and to be really intentional about it. So thank you for that question. I did have some slides, but I couldn't get my computer to connect, and we did it like 10 minutes before, so this is what we're working with. <laughs> yeah. Great question. Or if you're sometimes in an environment where you don't have shuva and you don't have that psychological safety. So, yeah. Who would like to speak to that? Uh, well, I'll just say a few words. One, one of the, you know, not only do you shuva other people and it's really powerful and I love the fact that it's actually in sequence. <laughs> Again, to the, the geek who likes to have uh, it be code. Uh, but you got to shuva yourself first, right? And, and I think that's part of being humble. And so... Um, be, when you're in that, that challenging situation, you know, just know that you don't have to have an answer right away, right? And, and give yourself um, some time and also some credit that, you know, you need to soak on this for a while. And, you know, it's sort of like, like the old saying of no pain, no gain. Uh, you know when you're in pain that there's some growth that's going to come out of that. And so just stick with it, be humble, but also on the opposite side of that, this is a spectrum too, is humility and courage. Right, just stick with it. Know that you don't have all the right answers. That's your, the, the the humility in it, and then also know that there's a time for courage. And part of that courage is is saying, "Hey, I don't have the right answers, team. You know, what do you think we should do here?" As opposed to being, "Okay, you know, when it's a really bad time, I'm just going to tell everybody what to do." I, I need that advice too. We all do. Um, that's that's all I have to say. Do you want to talk, Sam? Yeah, so I, I think it was this morning in the, in the Grand Ballroom at 9 o'clock, the session, or maybe we heard the themes last night. There's, there's been so many wonderful snippets that I've been able to take away from this conference. Um, but what I would say is that if you find that mistakes were made and um, we need to grow out of those mistakes, that's where you, you know, put your boots on, tighten up your pants, and be the change that you want to see. Right, and and sometimes, not always, but sometimes, um, you might find yourself in an environment that is simply toxic. Right, I found myself in an environment like that. Um, in fact, I was sitting on the couch with my husband one night, and I was like, "Honey, um, I either turn in my notice now and look for a job full time, or I work and I um, look for a job on the side, because I needed what was best for me at that moment." Right. And he was incredibly supportive. We were well aligned. <laughs> um, the next day, I got called into the office for something which I did not appreciate being called in for. And I called up my husband. And I was like, honey, today's the day. <laughs> and, um, and that was um, a gift that I had from my husband of the support and, um, and the alignment. It took me some time, a couple weeks, to, to land on my feet and find the next opportunity. Um, but sometimes you can't fix it. And what I found was, is that in hindsight, um, my departure sort of triggered some changes, right? And it wasn't that I was the problem or, or anything else. It was my departure sort of flagged that there was a bigger problem and they needed to, to work on it. And so it's really exciting to see that, um, you know, I, I love the people now that I, that I worked with back then. Um, the, the organization has grown and um, is, is flourishing, and I'm really excited to see that. Um, but when you are seeking alignment, you have to personally align with where you are. You have to, you have to if, if you're working somewhere that you do not align to, you are going to be miserable. And it's okay to know that you are miserable and that you need to find another path. What I love about that, Sam, is that's really a gift to that organization in addition to being a gift to yourself. It's like, I'm going to set this boundary. I'm not going to stick with this. I'm not going to allow myself to be treated this way. But that also ends up being a message 
back to the organization, but also to other people in the organization. And so having the courage to stand up for yourself is what I like to call the personal alignment piece of this. Right? There's personal alignment, there's relationships you have one-on-one -on -one with people you work with. You're, obviously your manager is a really important one. Uh, but then also with the relationship with the group. So personal, interpersonal, and team alignment. So you know, it's the same kind of principles from just inside you all the way up into every organization that you're part of, no matter how big it is. And that's one of the things I really love about alignment. And I teach this to people on my teams. I teach it to startup founders. And once they, the light goes on, oh my, this is like superpowers, right? And it's super simple. Uh, Shuva is a, a superpower. Co-creation is a superpower. Versatility is a superpower. And you start to realize, hey, this leadership thing, maybe it's not as hard as I thought. It's, and, and one of my favorite quotes, I always quote this to everybody, is Leonardo da Vinci. His, his simple, a very simple quote from him was, simplicity is the ultimate sophistication, right? You don't always have to impress people with complexity. And in fact, too much complexity kind of has people rolling their, their eyes back in their head. So focus on those simple, powerful things. Yeah, thank you so much. Uh, yeah, Carol? Okay, sure, thank you. Um, just, just to add really quickly to that, um, that if you embrace these principles of alignment, and these are principles of inclusive leadership, that you will come to this organically and naturally without even following the four steps and the five C's, that really embracing these principles is what leads you to inclusive leadership. And you can do that at any level, that you can really affect change from within an organization, even as somebody, you know, down the totem pole, <laughs> that embracing these principles, really leaning into them, and becoming that inclusive culture and that inclusive leader that you want to see, you know, will really, really help um, to, to stay the course. I think that gentleman may have left, but to stay the course when it, when it does get challenging. So with that, you know, we've come to the end of our time. I want to thank all of our panelists. We've got Roger Tonis, Dr. Michelle Loy, and Samantha Fuchs. Thank you so much.